Well, hello everybody. Lovely to see a, a big group of you from a lot of different clusters and parts of the Institute on a lovely sunny day where I'm delighted to welcome Thea Hillhorst um, for today's seminar. Um, I think she won't need much introduction to, to many of you. She's a professor of humanitarian aid and reconstruction at the International Institute of Social Studies um, in, in The Hague, linked to Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And I'm particularly happy that, that Thea's with us today because um, a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, last month, a couple of months ago, we had a fantastic visit from um, the senior leadership team at ISS to discuss areas of collaboration and really agreed and found and reconfirmed that there are so many commonalities um, of interest, but also of the ways we work and of our kind of values as research institutes operating in the field of global, global development. And we've agreed to try and strengthen our collaboration and to find some concrete ways to take that forward. Um, and one of the prime areas that came up was the work on humanitarian aid and learning and disasters and development um, that Thea has been absolutely leading and that is becoming increasingly important to us here. So this is a very good follow-up from that meeting and I hope will be the start of some other good conversations. Also really pleased to welcome people who are online. We're streaming this event, so even if you're not here today, listen and enjoy and we'll have a chance to contribute to follow-up conversations. So I think as usual, Thea's going to speak for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. We'll see how it goes and then we'll have a chance for questions and comments. Thanks very much. So over yeah, to you. Sure, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I know life is so full of events and seminars and everything when you're, especially when you're at IBS. So I feel really honored that so many of you came to listen to my talk. It's really great. And of course, also thank you very much to Melissa, the whole team, for the invitation. And um, I'm very, very pleased. As Melissa says, we are really building up some joint stuff between IBS and ISS. There are already some projects ongoing with colleagues in ISS, and uh, here I'm ready as well to speak with you and perhaps explore and see where commonalities are. That's really great. Now I have a PowerPoint which is very brief and not exactly related to my speech, and the PowerPoint is uh, purely commercial, so um, I will tell some stories around it. But the PowerPoint starts actually with the security guidelines that we produce, and I want to pay. Uh, very short attention to these guidelines. Um, I'm not sure, of course, where IDS stand. We haven't had yet a chance to talk about this, but in general, you could say that the academic world is sort of running behind in uh, developing policies for security and safety of fieldwork of researchers. And um, what we currently see, because there is more attention to it on account of events that have happened and insurance issues, that now we see that universities seem to jump on security policies, but that <coughs> is being done by the administrators of the university. And that is, of course, very bad, because they have these very clunky responses to security problems, and they will just simply say, nobody goes to Africa, for example, or this kind of uh, very exaggerated rules. And therefore, I think it's really important that as researchers, as academics, we sort of keep the policy making first in our own hands and make sure that there are policies because we are entitled to some duty of care mm -hmm. at the same time that we convince our administrators that Africa is not one just one space on a map that you can have policies for in general but you have to be slightly more nuanced about it and that it does make a difference when you're a researcher you're embedded you have your local contacts and you can trust that is different from just barging in as a tourist or whatsoever so um i'm trying to play a little role at least in the netherlands in trying to get universities to come up with these more nuanced policies also to have good insurance um, in the netherlands there's only one university now that has more or less insurance for its uh, students otherwise none so our students and our staff are all underinsured when they go to more dangerous areas where the humanitarian crises are happening. And to have a policy to have some backup system when something goes wrong. 
and uh, it was brought to me quite strongly when I, I had unfortunately a PhD candidate who was kidnapped for a while, only a few hours, and she escaped, and so nothing like real harm done, but the psychological impact is huge, and if you're not ready with some level of backup system, as we were not, but it all worked out well, but we had to improvise like crazy. And then afterwards you think, why did we have to improvise so much? We should have had something in place for this kind of event. Anyhow, so that's why we wrote the guidelines. If you are, the guidelines are specific because they are about researchers. It's not just an NGO guideline. And uh, for researchers, of course, it is different because the ethics of research, the quality of research, and the well-being of research <coughs> are all very strongly interwoven with issues of security and safety. Are you talking about your own security as a researcher, an academic from an uh, international university, and how about your research assistants, the people you interview? So all that is in the manual, which is now warmly recommended. The Google thing, the, how do you call it, the bit.ly is there, so you can just download it and, and use it as you please. Now, uh, going to my real topic, which is the turn to resilience in humanitarian crisis and uh, recovery. Now, if you take humanitarian aid in a glance, so sort of the last 20 years, huge changes, huge changes. If only in terms of budgets, in uh, the mid-1990s, the worldwide budget for humanitarian aid, and the official budget was 5.5 billion. And in the early 1990s, humanitarian aid comprised around 3% uh, of ODA. And very quickly, in, in the, around the turn of the century, it has become to stand at around 10% of ODA, which is, of course, sadly on two accounts. It also goes, it's also about shrinking of, of development assistance, but it's also about rising of humanitarian aid. It's also a bit fakey because the more budget available for humanitarian aid, the more agencies are inclined to transfer work they would have done in the related development to their humanitarian budget. So you also see some transfer, but basically I think it is a real trend. And uh, we see that there are many, many more players in, in, in the field of humanitarian assistance. Um, Huge developments in coordination, communication, and logistics. Uh, if you take coordination alone, I don't know if you're familiar with the virtual OSOC, but if there is a disaster happening, we could go. You can go to internet, and you can actually follow exactly which country is promising what in terms of. Uh, we are sending off a plane with so much food to this disaster, and somebody else will too. And then the US said, "No, no, stop, hold it." We have enough actually, why don't we go there or there or the other? So that is really amazing. And within 24 hours, after a big disaster, within 24 hours, the reconnaissance teams from all around the world are in situ to look at what is necessary, what needs to be done. Increasingly, of course, with GPS to see where the damage are, where the needs are. Communication, if you're familiar with, for example, the financial tracking system, it's really impressive. I think even more than in development, you could check, every, every student can go to the financial tracking system of Orcha and see how much money was pledged, how much money was actually given for each of the crises, how much is needed, how much percentage of need is now fulfilled, that's really there. Logistics, the tracking and tracing of aid, that's really, really very different <coughs> at the moment. Also, the movement of refugees can be followed day by day, how many people are now coming here, what is required, what will be sent. It's a huge machinery. And what we've also seen in these past 20 years is that in 94 uh, we saw the first code of conduct for uh, the Red Cross, Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement and the humanitarian NGOs. And after that there's been um, yeah, almost a mushrooming of guidelines and initiatives standing out at the moment, of course, the Interagency Standing Committee, which brings together um, the United Nations, the big clubs from the United Nations, plus the Red Cross Red Crescent, plus some uh, <coughs> representative of NGOs, and which is a constant machine of delivering guidelines, principles, policies, of all sort of nature, if you go to this website, there's quite a lot of very detailed 
guidelines how to work with children, how to bring disabled people, how to go about uh, sexual violence, etc., 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 etc. So uh, there is the core humanitarian standard, which was the product of the merging of several standards. There were just too many standards, so they've been uh, talking together to get a better sort of joint standard out, which is the core humanitarian standard. There's the sphere project you may have heard of or not. But so there's lots of things that are happening. So where do we stand at the moment? Uh, firstly, humanitarian assistance has become extremely effective in saving lives. And I'm saying this because I don't know exactly about the UK, but in the Netherlands, humanitarian aid has gone uh, sort of sour in the media. There's lots of criticism and, and, and uh, yeah, in a way, rather bad reputation of aid. And it seems that massively people seem to overlook the simple fact that humanitarian aid actually saves lives, and quite a lot of them. So we can criticize aid on many accounts, but lives are being saved. If you look at the 19th century famines, the big famines of the 19th century, you could speak about 10 million deaths of one episode of famine in India and China. We've had a few of those episodes. And of course it would be grotesque to say, oh, you see, humanitarian aid works. <laughs> it's not like that. I mean, there's development, there's technology, there's irrigation and what have you. But there is also definitely the development of humanitarian aid that can step in when it is necessary. And uh, for example, in uh, 2011, when uh, the Horn of Africa had its worst drought in 60 years, it's very significant that in Kenya and Ethiopia there were no excess deaths, none, zero. So the, the death statistics of that year of those months were exactly the same as the year before. There were no excess deaths. Mm. On the other hand, in Somalia, where aid couldn't reach because of the war that was going on, Al-Shabaab on the one hand, anti-terrorist legislation from the US on the other, so very difficult to reach, 250,000 people at least perished. So that shows the immediate effect that we now see of aid, and, and lives are being saved. At this moment, um, humanitarian budgets are mainly used for conflict situations, 80%. So whereas uh, aid, the, the examples I give is more related to natural disaster, where it is most effective, there is now 80% going into conflict. But um, <coughs> there, uh, you could say there's a mixture. Also in conflict situations, natural disasters happen, and quite a lot of them happen. So one of the things I find really annoying in, in humanitarian policy is they always speak about either or. We have conflict or we operate in disaster. But 35% of the natural disasters are actually happening in a conflict area. And that makes a lot of sense. First, natural disasters don't know about conflict. They happen anywhere. They don't know borders. But also, in conflict areas, people are more vulnerable to the effects of climatic events or weather events. And also, <coughs> in some situations, the um, institutional capacities to deal with the event are less and eroded. So the impact of disasters can be much bigger in a conflict situation. And it is significant. I did a long uh, research in Angola on the history of humanitarian aid and, and the whole war. And when you ask people what were the worst episodes in their lives during the war, it was not during a particular offensive or when uh, the soldiers came or whatsoever or fighting. No, it was that year when the drought, there was such a drought that we couldn't survive. And so the, the impact of, of disaster on conflict affected people is really important. So actually my biggest project at the moment in ISS, my biggest research program is about this. It's about um, situations where conflict meets disaster. I have three PhD candidates working on nine case studies. And so I hope in years to come, maybe to come back and talk about that. Um, even though humanitarian aid is very effective in saving life, it's much less effective in uh, preventing issues, the disaster risk reduction much less effective, much more could be done, much more gains could be made, and also less effective in the recovery. Even if the, in the situation of natural disasters, there is a famous saying of Olsen, 
A disaster becomes political after two minutes. Two minutes after it happens, it's already a political event. And that's what we see happening all the time. The first two weeks, the relief situation, the relief period is relatively okay. It's very logistic, lives are being saved, people are being fed, people are being sheltered. And after that, it all becomes very muddy and very slow and very complicated and very political and very uh, well corrupt as well. Recovery. Uh, is of course a very complicated issue and we see that uh, humanitarian aid is not always doing so well there. And of course in conflict, also very difficult, but we have to remember that um, iconically humanitarian aid is working in conflict. That's, I don't know about you actually, I haven't checked your image of humanitarian aid, but that's the iconic image of course of humanitarian aid, that you go to a conflict area and you help people. But that's not how it, how it is at all. There's hardly any aid directly delivered to people in conflict situations. It's just too dangerous for people to be there and for aid to get there. So the vast majority of humanitarian budget are not spent in the conflict area, but at its margins. So that is going to refugee care, maintenance and care of refugees, or just in the aftermath of conflict. But Underpin fire aid is just very cool. It's happening, I'm not saying nothing is happening, but for me it's not a major story with aid. Now where we stand, another point of where we stand is that aid of course continues to be politicized as ever. And note my last two words here, as ever. I know some people are writing as if humanitarian assistance is now suddenly politicized and it is so it has become so politicized lately. Whereas I just don't know any epoch where aid was not politicized. It's just perhaps in different ways politicized. It is, but it has always been extremely politicized. <coughs> it's just what we have to analyze, <coughs> aid is being politicized. What is a difference perhaps is that aid is rapidly losing its reputation of being the do-gooders. And that is a change you can actually see happening. And you see it happening in many places, we see it happening in humanitarian arenas, where aid worker has become one of the most dangerous professions. Attacks on aid workers, aid is not being seen as neutral, but is seen as a sort of long arm of the West, or of the imperial powers, of the US, or the UN, which is also not considered neutral. But also in the West, in the, in the countries where uh, most of the humanitarian budgets come from, we see the erosion of the uh, reputation of aid, as I already mentioned, in the Netherlands. Uh, people seem to, I mean, taxi drivers will talk to you about like, oh yeah, uh, with the disaster, I don't know if I'm going to give money this time to uh, for this and that disaster, because uh, with all that aid, they will just <coughs> undermine the local market. <laughs> it's what the taxi driver is telling you when you're away when you're somewhere. It's, it's just everybody's knowledge that aid is really, really problematic. And in reality, of course, good humanitarian aid, good food aid, can actually rescue markets. Because local markets, what happens when the prices go up, uh, sellers will, will hoard their stuff and, and keep it back because they think, well, the prices go up next week, they will be higher, I just hold back on whatever I have, I don't bring it to the market. So when you then supply some food aid, it affects the prices, they go down, and then the guys in the market will think, oh, the prices are going down again, I better bring my stuff from the warehouses and bring them into the market. So actually humanitarian aid can repair markets, but that story never comes out. And everybody seems to know, at least in the Netherlands, oh, humanitarian aid, it undermines markets, we shouldn't do that. Anyhow, so the reputation of aid is quite uh, problematic. And what we also see at the moment is a lot of discussion on the nature of aid and the meaning of the principles, the humanitarian principles. Very interesting, the principles have survived the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, there was in the world the first UN summit on humanitarian aid has happened in May last year. Very interesting, it wasn't a normal UN summit. It was a summit with uh, stakeholders. Um, there were governments, there was the UN, there were NGOs. One of the reasons why this was such an odd summit was that 
governments were afraid that the humanitarian principles would be going down the drain if they would make it into an official convention. And especially the principle of independence might give way to a principle of, uh, that gives much more space to the sovereignty of state in dealing with crisis in their own country. And it was partly the fear of particular countries regaining control of humanitarian aid as a so in, in their sover sovereignty as a state that they didn't want it to be a normal UN summit. But surprisingly, towards the summit, the principles were reiterated by everybody. Everybody seemed, to, there was no question of the fifth principle anymore in the end. It's still humanity, impartiality, uh, neutrality and independence continue to be the core principles that have been reaffirmed in the, all the papers that came out of the World Humanitarian Summit. Looking back, it might have been actually a pity that the summit was not official because now it is being um, boycotted by many countries. Uh, Russia, for example, Mexico, Brazil, they all wrote letters beforehand, oh, we will not do anything with the outcome of this summit because uh, this is not a, a normal uh, state uh, matter, which is unfortunate also because I never even realized so strongly myself, but I noticed during the World Humanitarian Summit that the boards of the big UN agencies are, of course, made up of individual countries. So the World Food Program would be very inclined to move forward with the outcomes of the World Humanitarian Summit, but its board has been telling it that it has to remove all reference to the World Humanitarian Summit from everything it produces. So if, I don't know what happened afterwards. But at the time it was, if you would go to the website of the World Food Program, you would find no mention of the World Humanitarian Summit, because that would be blocked by governments that are part of the board of the WFP. Um, speaking of recovery, oh yeah, the next commercial break. <laughs> um, speaking of recovery, uh, recovery uh, remains to be understudied and under-theorized, we think. So we just published a book about it. I will uh, turn it around. I will leave behind a copy for the library. And um, maybe that way, because the camera's there. And uh, in the book, we talk about the micropolitics of socio-economic recovery. And that is uh, more or less an extension of, you might know the theory of uh, Kalifas, who talks about the micropolitics of conflict, and to analyze that conflicts are simultaneously driven by local and overarching agendas <coughs> that connect through alliances of local and national level leaders. And we find that in recovery you see similar micro-politics happening. So these national policies of recovery are being retranslated, you might say, at local levels, levels where local power struggles as a kind of prism change the outlook of recovery and the ambitions and, and the way development can be identified, can be imagined. Another key finding we have here in the book is that how aid is embedded and adds a new layer to the multiplicity of governance arrangements. In especially in recovery, aid, especially the United Nations, but also the bigger NGOs seem to seem to place themselves outside of the picture. So they analyze governance and they talk about going with the grain and they talk about the multiplicity of governance and can we work with the government or not and they seem to consistently forget that actually they're part of governance. They just add a layer to that whole messy multiplicity that is already there. So we have lots of case studies in that book about that. Okay, back to the humanitarian aid. Now, a major change that I see in the last years that is the story that tell that aid tells about itself, and that is why where the title of my lecture comes from: the turn to resilience. Sorry, I left my glass here. I'd like to illustrate this with um, a personal story about um, my own inaugural lectures. I'm a professor now at ISS, but I used to be a professor at Wageningen University, the same, 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 Humanitarian Aid and Reconstruction. So I did my inaugural lecture last year at ISS uh, in September, 
with my Nobel lecture I did in Wageningen, I was 10 years old, that was 2007. So when I started preparing my lecture, I sort of, you know, I took out my old lecture, sort of anticipating some really clever cutting and pasting, sort of quick things for my new Nobel lecture. And then I realized, only then it really came to me, like, I can't. There's just nothing, not a single paragraph that, that I could still use in the way I would analyze aid in 2007 <coughs> for 2016. So that's when I really realized the story of aid. I mean, change is not happening empirically so fast. Eh? I mean, usually it's change is going backwards, forwards, sideways, in all sorts of funny ways. But the story that AIDS tells about itself, that has really changed. That has really changed. And to some extent, there is some practice that comes with it. Now, if we go back for a moment with my opera lecture of 27, so that is 10 years ago, then AIDS was very much just the story about AIDS was the classic story of Henri Dunant, the humanitarian principles, AIDS as a life-saving endeavor, and AIDS as being very externally driven. So it was the, the, the agencies that come to bring aid. And this is the time, for example, that Chris Kramer wrote his famous book where he spoke about uh, recovery after conflict as the concrete makeover fantasy. So he was criticizing the fact that uh, recovery policies, post-conflict recovery policies, sort of assumed a complete void, that nothing function during the time of conflict, that there were no institutions left. So after the conflict, you could just make over <coughs> institution. So he criticized it by that beautiful phrase, the makeover, the, the makeover, the complete makeover fantasy that donors would have. So there was this assumption of void, institutional void. There, or there was an assumption that every institution was subsumed under the political economy of violence. So whatever you had left in terms of institutions, you would have to sort of get rid of because those were ugly, violent institutions. There was no eye for the political economy of survival, just the continuation of the economy. Because people had to survive, want to go to their fields, want to go to school, want to fall in love, want to get married, want to do funerals. The normality of life was just not there. And no eye for the capacity and the agency of recipients. Now, the main point then was the continuity between conflict and peace and the continuity between disaster and development. It was my main issue that I brought forward in the inaugural lecture of 2007. And of course, I realized that it was not my story, but I was resonating a story of many academics since the 1990s. Mary, uh, Mary Anderson, for example, who all spoke about agency, about initiative of refugees, about uh, institutions that kept functioning that you could deal with. It was also the story of many alternative agencies, well, not alternative agencies, but development agencies that were also working in humanitarian crisis. So they were much more in developmental relief, they were entering partnerships, we're talking the Oxfam's, we're talking the faith-based agencies, actually the majority of agencies were trying to build on what was there, even during conflict. But it was not a dominant story. The dominant story was the classic relief. And those others were all in the margins, sort of calling for big changes. Now, you might say that the big changes have come, and maybe more than, as usual, than the people advocating for the change had hoped for. So uh, isn't it the worst thing that can happen when your dreams come true? And that might now be the case in humanitarian aid as well. Because if we go to 2016, it's completely different the stories that A tells. The UN reports now talk about crisis is the new normal. You see it in any UN report that you open. Crisis is the new normal. UN speaks now not only more about the humanitarian system, but about the humanitarian ecosystem. Acknowledging that uh, apart from UN and the big donors and the, and the NGOs, there are lots of humanitarian actors. During the World Humanitarian Summit, there was a big recognition of those other actors. There is much more space for governments, especially, of course, in natural disaster. Since the uh, 2005 uh, Yobo Framework for Action, governments have really come back into the picture 
and that seems very normal. And it's of course, and it is very normal, but it wasn't like that for a while. Eh? In the early 1980s, when there was a drought in Malawi, I, international community would just send some money to the government. Okay, deal with it. And then, because of the growth of humanitarian actors in the 1990s, it became like automatic, knee-jerk. If there was a natural disaster somewhere of some size, the whole international community would fly in its, its, its agencies and take over coordination and just do it. And that was the case until Gujarat, when the Indian government was like, excuse me, what are you trying to do in my country? And that turned around a bit that atmosphere when we saw that international community started to say, okay, maybe we pushed it too far and we should give much more recognition to what governments do. And uh, then Sendai picked that up and brought back natural disasters in the responsibility of national, gov national, national government. But even in conflict, we see that uh, national governments are given, taken, I don't know how to say it exactly, but there's more responsibility for response located with national government, but also with local actors, agencies, uh, recognition of uh, humanitarian agencies in, in disaster-affected countries. We also see a real change in how people are being looked at who are affected by conflict or disaster. I dare say that the word beneficiary is almost dead now. I think it's buried. Eh? I hardly see it anymore. But it was normal. Every, in 2007, everybody would sort of automatically talk about beneficiaries. Very patronizing. Our beneficiaries. Our beneficiaries are particularly difficult because they're traumatized and they have a dependency syndrome, often like that. Um, and what we see is the introduction of resilience. Mm. And um, working towards resilience of people, building on the resilience of people and communities started, of course, with disasters, natural disasters, where resilience has almost, and perhaps unfortunately, replaced the term vulnerability, which to my mind is much more specific and much more, um, I don't know, much more mobilizing. We can talk about that later, if you like. But it started in natural disasters, but now the idea of resilience has also taken over in the responses with conflict. And that is actually quite new. And uh, is it okay if I speak for another 10 yeah. minutes or so? Yeah, no, that's great. That's yeah? really interesting. Okay. Um, as many trends, you can locate them in a specific crisis. For example, Amartya Sen, in his entitlement theory that grew from his own experience as a child or as a youth with the Bengal famine, and that's how he came to think about his theory of entitlement that then became a very general theory. Same with the turn to resilience that I can see and that I can see resonate in all the UN reports. It is really linked to the Syria crisis. What happened in the Syria crisis is that 90% of the people refugees from Syria prefer not to go to a camp. They just don't do it. I don't know, in the Netherlands, in the media, it was very clear that it was the case for Lebanon, and it also linked to Lebanese uh, policies in relation to all the refugee camps that didn't work so well and all that and all that. That's a story. But in Jordan and Turkey, it's the same. 90% is not staying in camps. And it is simply because refugees don't buy camps. They prefer, if they have some money, they prefer to go to bigger cities, rent some space for themselves, try to stay alive one way or the other, rather than sitting in a dual camp in the middle of nowhere. So in the beginning, the aid agencies panicked about it. In, in say, 2011, there was a real panic. Eh? The, all the agencies were sort of clustering together in a few camps we had, and they had no tools whatsoever to work with people who were not staying in camps. And they very quickly adapted, and now around the Syria crisis, you see that the humanitarian aid is adapted to people who are not in camps. So what happens is, um, refugees who are entitled to aid, they get a visa card or some, of some sort. So every month they just get 100 pounds or whatsoever, which they can just go to the ATM machine and get some money. But also other care uh, schools, Lebanon and Jordan schools, are not built for refugee children. 
but there are parallel, there's parallel education. So the uh, children go to school at, up until four, and then the refugee kids come and they have classes from four to ten, for example. So there's parallel systems in the normal schools. Normal clinics open up on Saturday with a free clinic for refugees. So you see that uh, the, 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 the resources, money, the survival, money for survival and, and for rent, but also healthcare and education has become embedded in many ways and it, is, it organizes such a way that it allows people not to live in a camp where agencies had control but they can actually now reach out to people who are living scattered in the whole area. Now, this is extremely significant, of course, for the way aid is being delivered. And in many ways, it's a very interesting development. As I said, it is what, um, what many people would have wanted, isn't it? That being a refugee doesn't mean that your life is on hold, but you can actually continue to live a life of your own. And, uh, in an area of your choice, surrounded by people of your choice, and, and, and sort of try to find a future for your children there and then. So in many ways, it seems a big improvement. And I would say it probably is, but there are also some big uh, issues happening with it. So one issue is that, um, as I said, this is really a turn to resilience, which is turning into a general story, but I have a feeling it's actually very specific for countries like Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan. And like it or not, these countries are middle income countries. Maybe lower middle income countries, but they are middle income countries. And it makes a big difference. And for example, when I was in Jordan, we, I went to one of those Saturday morning clinics. And they can't advertise it as a clinic for refugees, because that would be discrimination. And that would not be to the liking of the local population. So they have to advertise it as a free clinic for people who cannot afford healthcare. Mm. And then I ask them, so how do you know it's refugees that come to your clinic? And they say, well, of course, Jordans will never come to this clinic because we have a national health insurance system. So they would never bother to stand in the long queue on Saturday morning. They would just come on regular hours. Now, then I was imagining the same approach in, in Eastern Congo, where I very often come in Bukavu, where you say, okay, on Saturday morning we have a free clinic, and you hope that it will only attract IDPs, the internally displaced people. I mean, forget it. The line will be three kilometers long outside the <coughs> clinic, because everybody needs free aid. So, in that sense, I think aid is sort of now overstating a bit, like, oh, we have this new thing, the turn to resilience, and we can do it like this and that and the other, we don't need camps anymore. I think that's actually quite specific for particular countries and particular scenarios and may not be so transferable to other places. And of course, difficult because the story goes around. And now Kenya is saying, oh, we might also as well do away with camps, whereas the conditions there might be very, very different. So that's one issue. The second issue is that um, the, whole is, the whole resilience approach, the way it works in practice, is very specific. What it actually means is that you are not entitled to aid on account of being a refugee. Notwithstanding the Refugee Convention, being a refugee doesn't entitle you to aid. It's not enough to go to an agency and say, hey, I'm Syrian, I'm a refugee, give me a visa card. You have to prove your extra vulnerability. So you have to be a vulnerable refugee to get something out of the system. If you are an able-bodied refugee, you're supposed to take care of yourself and to work for your income. And there are several problems with it. And um, one problem is that um, agencies are not so fine-tuned in their uh, identification of who's vulnerable and who's not. So in reality, that is being translated as um, something which is just one word nowadays, and that is the word women and children. Mm -hmm. And um, that means that if you're not part of the women and children category, very broad category, you fall out of aid systems. And I'm really concerned about young men who are uh, refugees, both in countries like uh, who are in, in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, but also, for example, in Greece, 
where you now see that uh, sexual <coughs> violence that everybody thinks is happening to women, which is not the case anyway, but now we see that it's actually the young men who are forced to prostitute themselves in the parks of Athens, not the young women, because they can still get entitlements to aid. Very sad situation. So that is something, the politics of vulnerability come with resilience thinking. It's not enough to be a refugee, you have to be particularly vulnerable. So it is such a delicate thing now, these politics of vulnerability, and we have to look at it much better, especially around gender. I had a very interesting talk with a guy, I forget what he was from, I think IOM, and they were doing tracking and tracing of refugees. And he was saying, um, we make sure that we don't give uh, sensitive information to outsiders. I said, like what? He said, well, we will never tell the ethnicity of refugees. We will not say there is a group of such and so standing by that border because then people may come and kill them or they may not get aid or whatsoever. So I asked him, how about gender? He said, oh, that's not sensitive. I said, excuse me, that's not sensitive. The Canadian government, I mean, the sweet, beautiful, lovely, liberal, wonderful, everybody adores the Canadian government, has said that they will only take in women refugees and not men anymore. So gender is extremely political at the moment, maybe the most political thing that we have. <coughs> and finally an issue with resilience is that it brings about a major change in the role of the aid agencies. Um, and I think that has not been um, discussed enough about. Aid agencies, I, I, it's almost funny when you read about, some people think about aid as the empire and the, I don't know what, the, how the power of the aid agencies. Well, there is no power with aid agencies. They, they're extremely pathetic in real life, I think. So, but nonetheless, there is now a big change where you could say that the agencies were perhaps the kings of the camp. And it's true that they had a lot to say in the camps. In Kenya, the Kenyan government only brought the police to the camps and otherwise it was completely mandated. All governance functions were mandated to UNHCR in Kagama refugee camp. So they were to some extent the king of the camp. But not having the camp around, what are they now? And to some extent, you see, what, what I see happening now is that they become much more the bonds of power in ways that they were not. I was quite shocked to hear in Lebanon that Lebanon has closed the borders for people from Syria last year. And of course, they can't close the borders. They, I mean, they don't have a way to close the borders. It's very porous borders. So everybody can just walk over the border. So they can't stop people coming. Lebanon, but they can stop giving them aid and vitamins or what have you. And UNHCR went along. UNHCR said, okay, sure, when the Lebanese government pushed UNHCR, UNHCR said, okay, sure, we stop registering refugees. UNHCR stopped registering refugees at the request of the Lebanese government. That changed for me the whole issue around like who, what is humanitarianism, where are you doing, what are you doing, what is UNHCR? But nobody was almost talking about it, it just happened, it just happened. And then I think where is another road that agencies should take, and I'm not alone to say this, eh? I mean if you see Alexander Betts for example, is to become much more effective advocates on behalf of people who are in trouble. If you talk about resilience, and the refugees are living in a country where by law they are not allowed to work. So they have to survive in the grey of precariousness and there's no legal work, so they have informal labor. In Lebanon, the Syrians, what they say about the Syrians in Lebanon is that they walk like this over the streets. They try not to be seen. They make sure not to get into trouble. And if somebody shouts at them, they will just turn away. Why? They can't go to the police. They will not get protection. When they work in the fields, they may be paid afterwards, and they may also not be paid afterwards. It just depends on the person who hires them, whether or not they're actually being paid. And that level of precariousness shouldn't be the case for people. I mean, if we want 
refugees to take care of themselves, at least they have to be enabled to do it. And there has to be some legislation and a level of protection that they can take care of themselves in ways that are legal and in ways that, that, that yeah. I mean, there's of course lots of exploitation and abuse and we cannot solve, solve all of it. But at least to some extent there should be a level of protection. So I think humanitarian advocacy is the key issue for the future. And to some extent it is lobbying for an enabling environment. Not so much, I mean, humanitarians will say, oh, we're not into politics, we're neutral. But if you take international humanitarian law as the basis for your lobby or human rights, you are being neutral. And you can actually speak for people who are having a hard time. And you can do it. And also, what I think humanitarians would really be need, and it hasn't happened for the past 20 years, they don't link up with social movements. And I find it one of the amazing, most amazing issues of humanitarianism. In development, there is, it's, it's this, this, this funny mix of agency, social movement, and you don't see that in the humanitarian world. When we, the World Humanitarian Summit, there was, of course, the side events with NGOs, but they were very technocratic, and they brought the UN in. And of course, there was a, oh, I wasn't going to say the necessary anymore, just bury the word. There were people from conflict-affected areas to tell their story to the people and to the world. But there were no marches in the streets. There were no banners. There was no anger. There was no demand. Nothing, nothing, nothing was happening around. And I've never seen it, not in Sendai, not in Logo around the humanitarian uh, around humanitarian issues there's this now social movement and I find it really amazing and I always hope it will happen and, and I don't know it would be really great now if not if we don't do that I think what we will do is we what humanitarians will do is that um, humanitarians were of course uh, blamed for being kind of suffocating paternalists and it's time for humanitarians to take people in conflict-affected areas seriously, their dignity, their agency. But there are two ways in which you can do that, and one I will uh, show that with my precious pen, I hope it survives. One way of letting go is of course like this, and enable people to do whatever they need to do, and the other way to let go if you hold something strong is like this. And that is what we see happening at the moment. That instead of the resilience discourse, instead of that actually enables refugees to take care of themselves and to find space to survive, it is turning quite rapidly, I think, in a politics of abandonment, where agencies can simply say, oh, hey, look how resilient they are. Our job is done. Out of here. And that is the politics of abandonment, which is, of course, at the expense of all the people that should have a level of protection according to the conventions, refugee conventions, international humanitarian law and all that. Very rapidly going down the drain, unfortunately. My final point, Melissa, if I may, that is about ourselves. The role of humanitarian scholars and engaged scholars, I know that's one of the things that uh, ISS and IDS have in common, that our scholars like to engage. And I wanted to put your attention, we had in, uh, during the World Humanitarian Summit, the, there were quite a number of academics, of course, and for the first time we were addressed as a stakeholder. Um, so the UN brought us together. They started to write emails before the summit. You are a stakeholder and we expect a uh, statement from you and commitments as academics. And they made a venue for us. I thought it was really nice. So none of us had thought of it, but suddenly we, I mean, we all connected and engaged with something, with some discussion or some panel or with gender or whatever. And now suddenly we were academics, humanitarian scholars. And we were brought together in a venue on the first day and we thought, well, what shall we do? Well, why not also make some commitments? Everybody was making commitments. So we actually managed in just two or three days to have a set of commitments from the humanitarian scholars. And uh, among them is that we want to make research more relevant and more inclusive. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, humanitarian response is evidence-based. 
we want to localize research when the whole World Humanitarian Summit is about localizing aid, why not localizing research and really make an effort to build up academic communities in conflict affected areas and areas where disasters always recur. Mm -hmm. More attention for research uptake and also at the same time protection of academic freedom which is also an issue because too many academic scholars, uh, humanitarian scholars are working for agencies, are working for the UN and there's relatively speaking very little uh, space for independent academic research on humanitarian issues. So I just wanted to invite you to take a look at the commitments and maybe it helps you, maybe it can inspire you. They are now, uh, well, being, um, we are the steward of the commitments in a tiny way, it's on our website, is the International Humanitarian Studies Association that um, I'm also with and that uh, you can become a member of. And in the years to come, we are now reorganizing ourselves into a proper studies association and we're almost done. We just got a subsidy from the municipality of The Hague and we will be settled there and now we will really start to work to give some more um, noise, to make some more noise to, to the committee. Fantastic. Uh, that was fascinating. <laughs> no, um, so many themes there that, that touch on issues we've all been thinking about. Mm -hmm. IDS not conventionally having had a kind of humanitarian group, but yet we realised a few years ago how much work there was going on in various aspects of this space, and also going back, how we too were there at the beginning of some of these issues about linking, linking relief and development yeah, yeah. as it was often yeah. called there, early issues of the IDS bulletin and so on. And it's really fascinating to hear your both personal and scholarly account of the way these discourses and practices have shifted. So, I mean, a lot of specifics as well as the general I think people will want to pick up on. So why don't we just throw it open, let's take a few questions and comments and then let Thea come back on them and then we'll, we'll take some more. If you need to leave it to do, but I'd encourage you to stay till 2.30 because there's lots to talk about. Anybody who'd like to start? Or oh, Martin, yeah. Well, thank you very much, very interesting and some good links to follow up. A question, you, you said that um, you were not particularly comfortable with the shifting of language from vulnerability to resilience. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could elaborate on that a bit more. It, Vulnerability seems to have a, a focus purely on the humanitarian episodes and mm -hmm. capacity to deal with it. Whereas resilience, to me, seems to carry a more forward-looking agenda, which might perhaps deal with this RRD issue that um, has been um, a headache for humanitarian agencies for three decades, and there's still no further forward in resolving it. In fact. If there's only one area which I would have picked up on in your talk, it would have been there would have been a, a critique um, alongside the saving lives, but also been the critique that um, we've made no progress on this agenda in 30 years. Any other thoughts and comments in that area? Pauline, do you want to come in here? Um, yeah, I was quite interested by your last um, piece on the academic you know, and having academic principles. Um, and I just wonder how you see collaboration as academics with these institutes. And I, and I say that because I've, I've been working with WFP in that Syrian crisis in Lebanon and using their own amazing data. I mean, God, like they have such detailed data, you know. Um, we could show things like in some households only 2% of the food budget is contributed by WFP, which is tiny. I mean, it's tiny. And that's excluding, you know, all the other expenses that refugees have. Um, but you can't really use these data, you can't talk about it. You can use it for action research, for internal reform, and, you know, so they have these, these amazing data, and they feel that they're quite sensitive, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're really essential, I think, in transforming, you know, some of the systems in aid. And I, I don't really know how to get around it. Um, you know how, how, how you should go about it. Okay. 
see, I was delighted to hear you pronounce the word beneficiary long gone. But I'm not sure about that. Maybe not. <laughs> and I wonder if you could it's elaborate. And if, because having been, you know, having sat on the board of Oxfam and yeah. long argued that that should be banished from their vocabulary, I, I just, you know, rarely made much progress. So the question is, even if the word is gone, have the processes of how people are treated by NGOs and relief agencies changed at all? Mm -hmm. is, it a, is it just vocabulary change? Are they still received, you know, treated as downstream recipients of decisions and resources made elsewhere, provided elsewhere? Mm -hmm. okay. and, and if that word's gone, what replaces it? What, do we have new, new words that are capturing a sense of resilient agency and citizenship in the humanitarian world? Well, that's a few big ones to start with. This course is data vocabulary. Okay. <laughs> um, now, it's a good point for us about the LRRD, the linking release of the rehabilitation to development. I didn't speak about explicitly that this could be if, you, if, if I would unpack why the humanitarian aid is so bad at recovery that would come out of it. So it can sort of under that as well. Um, although, at the same time, I think. LRD, I'm not sure how bad the system has been. If you if you if you look at it on the whole, very little has been happening. But if you look at development around cash relief, for example, and what it is, that's huge. If you see how aid has started to work more with uh, local hospitals and what it's been doing there and trying to keep the local uh, medical care up and running, huge. So quite a lot of things have happened, and more than I think has been given credit to. Now, why do I like, I don't, I can see the point about resilience being forward-looking and being drawn in a humanitarian crisis. I can also see how resilience is um, taking the status quo as a matter of, as a given. So, people and communities are resilient, they can deal with shocks. They can deal with the miseries of life. There's very little question where the miseries of life come from and where the shocks come from. And to my mind, the critical notions around vulnerability, and then I'm thinking about you know, the cringe model, the early vulnerability studies, uh, Ben Lisner and the whole crowd, Terry Cannon. <coughs> that was a very politicizing way of dealing with vulnerability. Now, you could be equally politicizing around resilience. And uh, you can also say resilience is about negatives to the outer world, responsabilizing your government, and all that. I just don't see it happening so often. But resilience is internal, it's about people. Yeah. Vulnerability is about context. Resilience is much more pointed. Now that depends a bit which, which definition you take. For me, vulnerability has always been about people. Yeah, that's good. You can use the people, of course, sometimes. Yeah. Whereas resilience, for me, is much more about communities. <laughs> resilient communities. So, that's but climate change. I think by the end we like to we like to we, we want the same things and it's the entry point you take. Um, but I think the, the sort of you're vulnerable for something, and then you have to ask where does the something come from? What is the something? And that that lacks some analytical power to bring. Whereas resilience, you can actually say, Wow, look, we're so resilient, we can help to make more resilient, isn't it great? Like, that's different. But of course, every term can be used in different ways, and it can be co opted, and it can be used more political as well. I think as I mean, people here would very much recognize that, I and mean, we've been doing a lot of work in other groups, come colleagues who are not here today in the yeah. step center and so on, about precisely yeah. the politics of resilience yeah. and yeah. the use of what's become yeah. a very big buzzword with different exactly. yeah. No, you can you take it from take it from ecology or psychology yeah. and you've got very yeah. different connotations again, I think. And it's just worse. It's just yeah. worse. Yeah. Yeah. Almost every discipline has got its own definition yeah. of resilience. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the question about working together with WFP, I mean, by all means, I would. And it's wonderful if you can use data. And there are very exciting things happening now, especially in the big data sphere, so where you see WFP is a forerunner, but also some of the other agencies, IOM, as I mentioned, working together with academics, which is really great. I just find that we also need to reserve some space for independent academic research. 
and there have, to my knowledge, been very little uh, designated research envelopes for research in humanitarian crisis. And uh, that's a pity. So that was my point. The beneficiary, well, I don't know if it's really gone, have the processes changed? I think I've always been less concerned about the beneficiaries in the way that you describe it, being at the end of a long decision track and being almost powerless in the face of it. I love this term victimcy by uh, Matsu Tass that denotes how people in, in their apparent powerlessness are actually very powerful because they very often play the act of being powerless and they play the and the people are very skilled at playing the victim and they know exactly how to do that and what to say and not to say to a system to be seen as a victim that needs aid. And when I said before that aid agencies are actually quite pathetic instead of very powerful, I also have seen that happening in the face of the recipients of aid. During my, my uh, whole PhD work, which I haven't touched upon, but which was about uh, NGOs in the 1990s, was about NGOs in the Philippines, I found that the communities were much more powerful than the NGOs. Because the NGOs would walk in, they had a certain mm -hmm. agenda, people would just retranslate the agenda, take the money, use it for something else, find ways of using aid in exactly the way they like, redistribute it differently, Aid is only given to women and children, never mind to go home. You, just, you know, all those kind of things. So I find there's quite some power with the people on the, on the receiving end of aid. So in that sense, I'm not that concerned about the power position of aid recipients. Um, in my novel lecture, I use this idea of victimcy and I, I, I juxtapose it to as the counterpart for it is ignorance which are the aid givers who actually know very well what is going on, but just need to ignore all those realities because they have to report mm -hmm. about this and that and the other. So you see victims see meeting ignorance, and they all play the game together. <laughs> I need aid, I will give it to you. Oh, thank you very much. This is, you know, it's, it's almost like a play acting in, in many situations. Um, what would be the new world? Well, you were with us and today. My new world would be citizen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> People who have rights and obligations and who are not just, you know, supposed to get something, but they also should have some responsibility for the people around them and for the community. Right. Yes. Just as one of the arguments that was put forward by the British government for not accepting refugees in was that they would invest more in humanitarian assistance to stop people from trying to cross the seas to go overseas. But we obviously haven't seen any reduction in the number of people who are trying to flee, even if it means risking their lives. So how, how, is, that, is that something to do with the failure of humanitarian assistance in making the absolute modicum conditions for survival for people, including things like higher education, which we had an IDS bulletin on some of the articles around humanitarian aid. One of the, one of the main critical issues was higher education. A whole generation of young people yeah. losing any opportunity yeah. of yeah. any mobility as a consequence yeah. of losing out on yeah. education, which humanitarian aid doesn't actually deal with. Yeah. So is that a flawed narrative when you say that's invest in humanitarian assistance as a way to stop the, the people from trying to cross borders and cross seas um, uh, at, at huge perils, um, you know, perilous journey uh, to escape. Yeah. That, that's the first question. The second oh. question has to do with the social movements, because yeah, I think you've raised a really important point, and thank you for raising that. We, we, we always talk about collective action, but we don't actually talk about collective action in the context of people who have been displaced who would have at least on a grievance dimension a very strong reason to collect to, to collectivize and engage but wouldn't part of it be a, a major a sense of major threat that if they appear as a collective and if they become visible as a group that they would be thrown out of the country in other words the fear of appearing as an organized social movement 
would mean that their existence is jeopardized because they're not citizens, because they don't have the rights of, I'm a passport of this, you know, I, I have a passport, I belong to this country, you can't throw me out. Two really important questions. Do you, is there anything else on this theme, particularly around the social movement question, perhaps, or citizenship and rights? Yeah. Yeah. I just I was also thinking about the social movement aspect, and it, I think that it, part of it might go back to something that you mentioned in terms of the sort of pseudo role of government that these organizations take on. And so when people are living in these large camps for protracted periods of time, um, the experience is. It's so draconian and so dis disempowering, and even NGOs that are supporting these structures are operating like pseudo governments. They're using military terms like base camp. That you would come out of something like that, and I'm not sure that social movement would feel like an option, both for people who are refugees living there, but also even for people that work within those systems. There's like something very specific about how militaristic humanitarian aid can be uh, in these immediate or protracted response crises, the way that it's structured. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, do you want to come back on, on that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, your question about why uh, and if humanitarian aid would be effective to uh, stop border crossing, for example, eh? I'm, your point about higher education is really, I, ne I never saw the bulletin, but that, that I can resonate with it very well, so I, I love to see it, and, and it's what you hear from people, why do, you, why do you want to go to Europe, because my children need to go to university, and um, also, I mean, with the whole Millennium Development Goals, the fact that everything went into primary education, elementary education, and there was no indicator for higher education, so never mind about higher education, that was basically <laughs> the case since 2000. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, so I, I really em emphasize with that, but uh, the humanitarian aid and border crossing, I find it a very complicated issue mm -hmm. to just, you know, deal with it like in, in, in half a minute. And, and, and Sometimes you think if only they did, if only they did do some proper humanitarian aid, if, they really, if, 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 if Europe really wanted to stop refugees, they could have done so. so such a better job, even for the wrong reason, because mm -hmm. for me, refugees are my, many more refugees are welcome. Mm -hmm. But so, if even if for the wrong reason, they could have done a lot of good by actually stepping in and stepping up aid and do a proper job out of it. But they haven't so much. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They haven't so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. They could have, they could do much more if they were serious about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Um, the social movements, well, I'm not so sure if I, uh, I can see how there are so many phases to humanitarian crisis, humanitarian aid, and what, it, what you're saying, are you thinking of a particular situation or not? Are you talking uh, Dada up or are you talking... Dada and Zatari, um, yeah. both I, sort of I've worked in, um, and I found them to be shockingly um, inflexible, and UNHCR especially to have this sort of overlord operation where, I mean, even in agencies like WFP, UNHCR had the final say and and that was that was it. And yeah. that trickled down to to the experience of everyone. In but it's also a bit telling that I guessed it right, that you would be talking mm -hmm. about that up. And um, so I think that a lot has been written about humanitarianism on the basis of um, what is happening in a few big camps, which together represent only a, a small fraction of camps and camp lives. Those really big camps are run in really militarized ways to some extent. There are only a few of them. The other thing is to say, I don't know if you are familiar with the um, work of Bram Janssen, my, my former PhD candidate who wrote this book, The Accidental City, about Kakuma refugee camp. And he writes about how, although the UNHCR has this sort of authority as a grid over the camp, what is really happening in the camp has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with UNHCR. It has to do with relationships of different groups in the camp, how they reorganize themselves, how they set up their economies, uh, through discord and all that, but what is very striking 
is that the agencies in, in Kakuma refugee camp, they all also have uh, jobs for refugees. So it's refugees themselves who can say who will and will not be on the list of uh, resettlement to a third country. Those are refugees, because the UNHCR, WFP, they all work with committees of refugees that have quite a big say in who will and will not be given something, and have a huge powerful role. But their power is only partly derived from their task for the agency. It's a social level power and all that. But interestingly, at the moment that some youth wanted to set up its own organization and they started to make a newspaper and they started to, uh, I don't know exactly what they wanted to do with themselves, but there was a small little club, you know, like almost social movement like. UNHCR immediately cut it in the butt. No way. Participation happens on our terms. Mm -hmm. No spontaneous um, mm -hmm. collective of refugees that mm -hmm. will write together. They wanted to make a journal, I think, a newspaper for the camp. There was no way that they were allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So there comes the, the... But it's at the same... I mean, I can... I mean, we all know how discourses work and how Foucault works and all that, so... You're, you come to an agency and you're there for in the first year you think oh I'm going to do it so differently and within a year you're part of that whole machinery. I don't know what happens. Why through some level of osmosis mm. <laughs> uh, aid workers just lose their critical edge and stay in that camp and stay behind their walls when it's so easy to walk out and hang out with the refugees if they wanted to. Mm. But in very few do. It's not huh? now. In Zachary, it's not. I'm not sure. But I mean, things are so restricted. Even movements within the aid workers, you yeah. cannot go interact with other people. There are logs, and I mean, just endless amounts of restrictions on the types of interactions that you're allowed to have. I, I don't know if it's increasing or if it's like you're saying. It's these large camps that are being studied more. Um, but it, you know, it. They do seem to wield a lot of power in that in that context that causes people to do it. I, I would, it seemed to sound like from the people I talked to working there for a couple of years that they were internalizing some of this. Um, and it was, it was striking. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even then, Satari, it's 90% uh, of the people don't live in camps. And that changes the relationship between the aid workers, the UNHCR and all those, and the mm -hmm. recipients of aid tremendously. Tremendously. So I, I, I noted that statistic, and I, so you were saying 90% of the refugees don't live in the camp, or 90% of the staff don't live in the camp? Refugees. 90% of, of the like Syrian refugees that come 90% of Syrian refugees, according to the statistics I've seen, 90% mm -hmm. of Syrian refugees in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan are not in camps, mm -hmm. but they live in, I think, the informal settlements, which are sort of tented camps kind of in Lebanon would be under the 90%, but most of them is just cities renting a room. And they had the social workers seeing them. Well, I, I went to visit a family and uh, the guy was lucky, in a I guess, because although he was a man, he was obviously disabled, very obviously, so he was entitled to aid. And then once every six weeks or once every month, some social worker from a local NGO would drop by and they have a, a carton box with some stuff in it for children or something. And then they have their visa card with 180 euros on it every month. So that changes relationships a lot. Okay. There's one question I, I might ask. I mean, it goes, a lot of the things we've been thinking about, and it picks up on some of what you've been saying, is that the humanitarian world operates as a kind of bubble in a way. It's mm -hmm. quite self-referencing. You've been talking about the languages that it adopts, its own, the, the stories it tells to itself, and so on. And that resonates very much, I think, with what, what we picked up in a lot of our work. So what do you do you see any changes, perhaps as part of this move to resilience, around the humanitarian world and its actors and its agencies, almost being forced to interact better and more fully with governments, with NGOs, with, with others? And, and what kinds of effects is that having on the learning that goes on amongst humanitarian workers and agencies themselves? This is very much a theme. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Lewis wants to chip in here. We're, we're, we're just launching a humanitarian learning centre, which is, is, is 
something that we sort of have a contract for, which is partly looking looking at these interactions. Very really interesting. Interested in your no, it's a very open question mm. because it, it's such a recent change. I would yeah. say that it's a very open question, and I, I'm, I'm very curious as well. We will talk later this afternoon. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious on, on the stuff that you're going to do and what will happen. Because it must have made major changes in agencies at the moment, what's happening. But I don't know exactly, I mean, I don't know. One of the things um, I was thinking as, as we were talking, we've talked a lot about refugees. Uh, and of course, refugees are, as we know, I mean, the highest number of refugees since the Second World War, so 20, 25 million refugees globally. UNHCR says if you add in IEPs, that's 60 million globally. But the humanitarian case, of course, is 100 million plus, um, quite difficult to define, but if we take even just the, just the UN appeals. So we've got a lot of people who the humanitarian system, as you all know well, Ted, having worked in Eastern Congo and all of those uh, fun places, We've got a lot of people that the humanitarian system is serving who aren't refugees, in, in, in fact the majority, and aren't even nominally IDPs. They're, they're just acutely poor, they're in places that are fragile, conflict affected, as, as you were saying earlier on. And I think that's one of the areas where the resilience mm -hmm. debate is quite interesting in the way that it's playing out. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with all of your critique, and it's not perfect, but I think there's a a gradual realization within the humanitarian world that a lot of the places it has been working, it has been working in for a very long time. And it's it's essentially been providing again, as we know, this kind of substitution service delivery to 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 people in places that are periodically acutely affected by crisis. Um, but but it does it on this very short term sort of basis, with a very short term mentality, with a very short term funding cycle. And I guess one of the questions that I see being asked, not answered yet, but being asked in the system is, are, are, are there ways of doing this better? And I think that's one of the questions that the resilience debate is promoting within the sector um, in, a, in a positive way, although, as you alluded to yeah. earlier, I think that you know, the, the answers are much more complicated and difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm not so good at number games to be honest, but um, 100 million is actually very little, huh? Eh? So if you think of, if you think of, oh, you were sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, no. So, so 100 million is is is. We have no number for the humanitarian case. Um, if you just take those affected within the UN humanitarian response plan, it's what used to be called the consolidated appeal to the CAT. It usually adds up somewhere between 100 and 120 million. If you look at the the trade database for natural disasters, the you know the one that's hosted in Belgium, and there's 300 million old people affected by natural hazard disasters every year. So so the figure's very fluid, but it's anywhere from 100 million to yeah, half a billion. billion. I'm not so worried about 300 million, because being affected by natural disaster, that could actually literally mean that the water was in your garden by three centimeters. So I find a very strange number, but if you think of the uh, sort of the bottom billion kind of precarious folks. I just read that 80% of them live in conflict areas, conflict affected areas, and extreme climate change or climate affected areas. <coughs> and then 100 million is actually very little. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I always find this very puzzling because if you take as an intuitive definition of humanitarian aid that when you withdraw aid, humanitarian as in contrast to develop, you withdraw humanitarian aid and then you would see an immediate rise of morbidity and mortality. Because it's life saving kind of aid. If you would turn it around, which you can by definition, which have an is equals in the middle, you could also say that humanitarian crisis, those crises where if you would apply some humanitarian aid, you would see an immediately reduction of mortality and morbidity and then I think we just there 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 should actually be more you would actually could have that you could say that there could should be perhaps a billion people in humanitarian aid. Why am I saying this? Because you, you mentioned Eastern BRC and I can see why it is nice to think about resilience and all that but 
what strikes you most when you go to Eastern DRC, well, I have a PhD candidate who looks at IDPs, and they are not being helped at all. They, one or two of them get once per six months something, and then they just have to do. They are being helped by their neighbors. What I find really interesting from her finding is that we all seem to assume that uh, people in Congo with authority are all predators and corrupt and terrible, but they actually help the IDPs. IDPs get help from the chief, from the, uh, the thing, from their, from their neighborhood. They get help from the, the president of the market who says, okay, you don't need to pay for your stall, you just come, come, come and sell. You don't even need, you know, pay the sex sometimes. They actually can be nice. So, not always, don't romanticize it, but these people don't survive on account of the humanitarian agencies that bring resilience to them, not at all. And, and yet, we have been doing humanitarian aid in Eastern Congo for the last 25 years. So this is, this is one of the questions, and I maybe speaks a little bit to yeah. the question that Melissa, yeah. Melissa was asking us, but we're doing a lot of humanitarian aid in these places. Um, an IDP movement, we set up a clinic, it's a free clinic for two or three years, then it closes down again, then there's another IDP movement, we set up another. Those clinics reach a small amount of people for a short amount of time, they don't reach people in similar circumstances 10 or 15 miles down the road, certainly not 30 miles down the road. But we're pouring in a bunch of resources, uh, having almost zero impact on those morbidity and mortality figures which, by the way, we're not collecting anyway, so we don't even know. Um, so again, the question is, you know, are there ways of doing our humanitarian assistance better in places like Eastern Congo, given that we've been doing it for 25 years? And given, as you say, equally, that now we're colliding very much with the development agenda, with the SDG1, the No One Behind agenda, because they're precisely that bottom billion that increasingly the development assistance is going to want to reach they're in those places that we've traditionally thought of as humanitarian cases. Like. And, you know, like I say, I don't think the resilience question is, is the solution, but at least it's helping us to pose some of those questions that we haven't necessarily asked ourselves before. Okay. Uh, we're nearly out of time, so I wonder if you might have anything you want to say in response to Lewis, although you can also pick it up later. But also perhaps, just to finish, any key, I mean, for a kind of academic audience, for us as engaged scholars, are there any key points that have emerged for you, maybe from the work you've done on the, the, the commitment and compact, that we ought to, ought to be thinking about as, as engaged scholars interested um, mm -hmm. in this particular area? Any kind of final take home yeah. points for all of us? I'm, I'm not sure if I can say something really sufficient. The, the thought that comes back to me is, to some extent, that for those few people that do get aid, it does make a lot of difference. Yeah? So when you say humanitarian aid hasn't had any effect, yeah, except for the people it helped. Yeah. And that is something that we have to remember. And I started with this, yeah? humanitarian aid actually knows how to save lives. I don't want to talk lightly about the fact that humanitarian aid saves a lot of lives. And that no matter how hard those lives are, I mean, some of those people actually have hope and they can make a better life for themselves. Humanitarian aid does help, but the skill it helps at is of course much too small. Is that it? Anyhow, so that is something that I think we need to be reminded of. Yeah. And otherwise, I totally agree with you. If you think of places like Eastern Congo and the numbers I gave, like if 80% of the bottom billion, so to speak, yeah. live in conflict affected yeah. areas, we need to step up, mm -hmm. we need to step sideways, we need to step down, we need to do lots of things and mobilize much yeah. more than we do yeah. now. Yeah. Great, well, thank you very much. It's been, uh, that was a fantastically kind of broad compass, but also sharp and challenging set of, set of thoughts for us mm -hmm. all. And I hope you have a good afternoon and opportunity yeah, 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 to take yeah, some of them yeah, forward yeah. and that we can continue yeah. to think together in this space. It's great. We'll definitely be looking up your, your commitment and studies association. Good. Good.